<clears throat> if you are a member of the Lake Erie Regional Group Regional Great Program, easy for me to say, you received one of our vineyard planning calendars. This is sort of what we're going to use and hope that you use as a guideline as you go through and make your decisions. It is also used as a tool for you to be recording when your bud break was, when your um, fruit set is. All the information, I'm sorry, don't get sick as I fast forward really quickly because I want to try to get us over to where we would normally around May. So that we can have some phenology that's going on there. Normal bud break is called for the past 45 years at um, Cornell at the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program, basically in Fredonia and then in Portland for the last 10 or 11 years. Bud break is the average as on May 5th and we called it on April 20th of this year. So I would like you to mark it in your calendars. What is at your station for Clara? We will put it at April 20th. And Kim, if you want to update about the NUA website. Um, sure. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to, if you hadn't heard yet, uh, NUA has been working for the last couple of years, I think, on developing a new um, website that's a little bit more user friendly. And so they have launched it officially. I've noticed that all the tools aren't quite accessible um, at this point. So the old standby is there, but the new, so the old one is uh, NUA, wait, I just type in and E and it comes up on mine. So it's NUA.cornell.edu. The new one is DEV, like development. So DEV.NUA.cornell.edu. So if you want to check it out, try out a few things, it should continue to improve this year. And then um, it will be replacing the old site as of the end of the year. So that's there. As far as the uh, PA uh, members, we'll be mailing those out. We did order them from the Cornell bookstore. We got to order them from there and then they come into our office and then we'll be mailing them out. So uh, hopefully within next week, uh, everything goes well. We have our office manager um, had some health problems uh, Boy, it's been well, quite a few months ago. And so someone from Crawford County is filling in for her. So there's some logistics there that we got to get taken care of, but uh, it, it'll get done. So hopefully within the next week, we'll get those uh, guides from Cornell store and then we'll um, mail them out. <clears throat> All right. A um, couple things I just want to mention real quick. And like I said, everybody, um, Brian or Kevin or Jen jump in as we're doing this. But, um, you know, when we talk about insect and disease management, weed management, um, one of the things I think, you know, we usually think about is, is immediately spraying. But, you know, for more specifically, I think for, for diseases, but also for insects, um, do as many cultural practices that you can do to um, help out, such as uh, when you're pruning you know, as much as you can remove, you know, disease wood, if you have a lot of phomopsis on the canes, uh, to the extent that you can, uh, mummies in the trellis, things like that drop to the ground. Um, you know, if you can avoid overly vigorous, vigorous growth, um, in other words, not put on too much nitrogen so that you just have a, uh, huge canopy and, you know, uh, that, that will impede, you know, your sprays. Um, if you have wine grapes, things like leaf pulling, uh, good weed control, uh, you don't want, and you guys are pretty good with that, but, you know, I've seen some vineyards where the weeds are, you know, can get pretty high underneath the trellis. And again, that will also impede, uh, your spray into the canopy and also will increase the, uh, microclimate, you know, humidity and things like that. So just anything you can do culturally, um, to help out. It is, is important in um, pest management. Um, scouting, we always mention scouting, that's extremely important. Make sure you guys are doing that um, throughout the year. Uh, you know, the quicker you can spot a problem, the easier it's gonna be to handle. Um, sprayer calibration, make sure you guys, you know, before you're ready to go, uh, you have your sprayers calibrated. 
uh, at least at the beginning of the year. And, you know, we'd like to see it maybe a couple times throughout the year as the canopy increases. Um, so try and keep on top of that. And um, then resistance management. I'm just going to mention that real quick. Uh, you know, try and as best you can to rotate or alternate your, um, your pesticides uh, between each spray. And when I say that, say you're, you're uh, putting something on for barry moth or, or um, powdery mildew, whatever, make sure it's not a chemical that's in the same chemical class. So for instance, if you're, you're putting on a um, sterile inhibitor, one of the DMI, like a tebuconazole, you know, then don't go to something like, uh, like a rally or a microbutanil the next time. Because even though it's, it's a different uh, active ingredient, it's still in the same chemical class. So try and, and alternate that. Um, and some of these materials, and Brian will be talking about some of these as we go through the different diseases, but um, we like to see no more than two times a season. And, and it might say on a, on a label, uh, you know, you can put it on three times or four times, but we'd like to see it, you know, no more than two, two times a year, the same material in the same chemical class, if you can do it. Um, and then finally, as far as uh, tank mixing, that's another resistance management strategy. When you're putting something in uh, tank mix, especially uh, when we're talking about say the uh, compounds that are in say class three that are fungicides, which would be the, the sterile inhibitors or um, frac group 11. And what I'm saying frac, that's the fungicide resistance action committee. And what they do is they put these chemicals uh, according to their structure and how they work into certain classes. So there's a lot of different chemicals that might be in one class and they all work similar, similarly in the, those classes. So we try and mix that up as much as possible. So if you're putting on a tank mix and I'll give you a, sort of an example, um, say it's later in the season and you wanna go after powdery mildew and you put in say a tebuconazole, which is a sterile inhibitor and then you also put in a Xyran. Okay, well, technically you're tank mixing two different fungicides, but if you're going after powdery mildew, the Xyram has no effect on the powdery mildew. So as a resistance management strategy, it's not actually, you know, it wouldn't work for that. So if, if that makes sense, I mean, uh, if anybody has questions or Brian, you want to jump in on that too, if you... <clears throat> Yeah, you know, um, I think for most of our diseases, at least for you know juice grapes, we've we've got plenty of active ingredients that we can choose from, plenty of uh, different frac classes <clears throat> to easily rotate in and out, um, and, and probably not use any one of them more than once or twice at the most per season. So. You know, for powdery mildew, we've got we've got frac eleven, frac three, frac seven, um, and and then we've and what frac fifty now is is what uh, Vivando is in. It used to be U eight, I think it's now frac fifty. Uh, we've got Quintec, which I think is frac thirteen, if I'm not mistaken. So we got a lot of different. Uh, I just named what five or six different frac classes for powdery mildew alone, how many powdery mildew sprays do you put on per season? Um, so you can actually get both without using any one of those more than once uh, in a season. And of course, you know, you want to pay attention, of course, to what phenological stage you're, you're applying it at. So different stages are going to be more uh, important than others for controlling mildew, especially on, on your fruit. Um, but, you know, and if you've got any questions about what frac class uh, goes in, just look at the label. It's very prominently uh, listed on the, on the first page of the label. So. so there's sort of just some of the 
general comments you wanted to make to keep in mind as we go throughout the season when you're talking about uh, managing different pests. So uh, I guess we can just open it up and see if there's any specific questions. And like I said, if there's not, um, you know, Brian and I can just start going through uh, the ph phenological stages, you know, um, where we are and what you should be looking for at that time. Um, yeah. If there Thank are you. questions, then we'll just try and answer those and then jump back to that um, uh, sequential order of, you know, what pests are coming up at what times. Thank you, Andy and Brian. I do need to interject and just ask again that if you are looking for credits, we need you to have your camera on, please. If not, that's perfectly fine. Okay, thanks. Does anybody have any questions? I know this isn't specifically a disease management thing, but you know we've had cold temperatures now this morning below freezing for four or five hours in some places. Um, some buds are out more than others, depending on your location and proximity to the lake. And we're about at 50% bud burst here, depending on where you look on our farm, uh, even a distance of, you know, another hundred yards from the lake seems to make a difference in the percent bud burst, um, where we get the diseases that, you know, move off the lake a little bit south and you know might hit some of our grapes 100 200 yards off the lake but not 300 yards off the lake and they're they're all different stages i i know on side hill road you may be at two two leaves exposed already so and it's of course going to make a difference in terms of bud when they're at the when they're more open like that i think you know from looking at newa this morning we we uh we had temperatures that dropped down to, I think, as low as about 27 degrees in some places. That's the lowest I think I saw, but I didn't look at all the sites along the lake. Um, we hit, I think, about 29 degrees here, and we stayed below freezing for about four or five hours. So any questions on that um, before we start talking about diseases? If it's not on everybody's mind, then fine, we'll just start talking about diseases, so. <laughs> oh, it's been on a couple of people's mind already. I have received yeah. four phone calls this morning before the meeting. <laughs> okay. So I guess it might be another one too. Yeah, I don't see anything in the chat box, but. Oh, what were the temperatures that were vulnerable? 29 degrees is no big deal at this stage? That's a good question. Let me share my screen for one second. This is put out by Terry Bates, which he has compiled from other researchers' information. Just one moment. Oh my gracious. Can you see that? Can everybody see that screen? I can't see you, so if you, yes, okay. Yep. Yes. Depending on what phenological stage you're at, and I can tell you a majority of the ones we have are here. There are still a bunch of going down this stage here where there are a couple more that are opening, but these are the critical temperatures that they're stating we're safe until around. Now there is some question as to how long we can be at those temperatures and hold it there and if they're still safe, but this is basically sort of a rule of thumb of what we go with. Does that help everybody? So it would be 28 degrees. Yes, yeah, that's about where we, where we got down to it, at least at the weather, most of the newer weather stations showed temperatures dipped at least to 28 to 29 degrees in, in almost all places that I looked at anyway. But, you know, the length of time that it remains there, I think is probably gonna make a difference too. And, and Larry, Larry just asked the question about the snow laying on the buds giving any protection. <clears throat> it is our hope that it would give us an insulated layer if, if we were to drop down and be a little bit colder. Yes. Does anybody else have any other questions on that? <clears throat> you should see me on this end. If I look scattered, I'm monitoring the chat box, looking to pull up pictures. People are sending me text messages and emails. <laughs> 
You know, I keep looking down at it and I can't see with or without my glasses. So <laughs> I'm moving back and forth. And <laughs> I'm going to mute for one second to answer a couple of the questions that have come to me privately in the chat. So I guess what we'll do then is, and if questions come up and, you know, Jen sees them in the chat, you know, she can break in. Yeah. Um, but we'll sort of just start. Uh, Again, we're at the bud swell stage. Um, and at this point, again, it's uh, usually flea beetle and cutworm. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, usually it, it, it's when we're at that bud swell stage for, you know, a length of time that we worry about those. Cutworm, I haven't seen much of. Everyone, oh, throughout the different years, I've seen it only a couple times uh, at a couple isolated areas in vineyards, uh, but grape flea beetle we see a little bit more often, usually along the wooded edge lines. Uh, but, you know, we get any, as soon as we get back into a little bit warmer temperature, we're going to just break right through that. So I don't think that um, flea beetle is really going to be that big a deal here this year. But if you have wood lines, if you had it in the past, you know, you just might want to check it out. Um, but you know, then we're going to say the one inch, we'll talk about the one inch and then the three to five inch uh, shoot growth stage. Um, and really at the one inch shoot growth stage, um, we're really not thinking about anything where we usually haven't until about 2017, I think it was, right, Brian? Um, yeah. And at that stage, we were about that one, one and a half inch, some places two inches. Um, when we got some really, pretty bad phomopsis and that was 2017. And that was, if you remember, that was a, a long period of really prolonged wet weather and it was cool. So the, the grapes weren't moving at all, but this disease tends to keep chugging along at lower temperatures than I think any of our other diseases. So, um, did you want to jump in like from the one and then three to five inch stage, Brian, and and sort of mention about phomopsis since that's the first thing we have to worry about? Yeah, and I, you know, I think from what I've read, uh, and especially from Wayne's work and Wayne's uh, uh, opinion about like, for example, the three to five inch spray, it it we should probably say that that is a an essential spray at this point in time. Uh, an essential spray for Concord's, Niagara's, that three to five inch spray or two to five inch spray for Phomopsis. Uh, we're talking about mainly putting like a Mangazeb product or Captan on at that time. Um, <clears throat> because, uh, you know, the, the research has shown that, uh, you know, it, it is going to pay off in the long run. It may not it may not be something that makes a difference every year, um, but in the long run and over the long term, the low cost of that application, uh, because you don't have to use full, you know, four pound rates of Mancozeb or full rates of Captain. You can use lower rates, two to three pounds of Mancozeb or something like that, or a Manzate product, a formulation. Um, <clears throat> it's a relatively inexpensive spray and, you know, over the long term, it's, it's going to pay for itself, basically. Now, one of the problems we've had in the past, like Andy mentioned back in 2017, um, you may remember we had, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, it was about two or three days of constant uh, wetness on, on the plants at that time. It was hovering right around 50 degrees. And um, it even dropped down to, I think, 48, 47 degrees for a period of time. And the, the newer model actually kicked it out as a, as a Phomopsis infection period because of that. Uh, but it was an infection period, we know, because uh, Mark and I here at the lab jumped in the truck and drove around Erie County and every vineyard, literally every vineyard we went into, literally every shoot on every conquered vine had this black discoloration on it. And it looked a little atypical of Phomopsis, but as 
the days and weeks went on, it was phomopsis. And that was the result of that horrific, um, lengthy infection period. Even in vineyards that, you know, had been well-maintained for many, many years, uh, were stricken with it. Uh, of course, the ones that were, had a lot of old dead wood in it and, and were problem spots were even worse off. Anything that wasn't out that far, wasn't out to two inches or so, uh, we had some Vidal here at the lab and, and Vignol that wasn't anywhere near that point. They were absolutely clean, um, nothing there. So, you know, it, once they got to that one and a half, two inch place, um, that's when they really became vulnerable. We say three to five inches simply as a kind of a ballpark figure to try to hit that target. Um, I know in, you know, when the weather warms up, they blow through that one to five inch stage very, very quickly in, in a matter of a day or two in some cases. So it takes some preparation uh, to be ready to, to get that spray on. And very often, of course, it's raining, it's wet. Um, and here we are again, <laughs> um, you know, at one, one inch of shoot growth in some places. And we, you know, these temperatures, I think, in the 30s are obviously too cold for phomopsis. But once we get up to the upper 40s, low 50s, that pathogen is going to kick in and start to become active. And, and we'll, um, we're mainly guarding against um, early shoot infections and especially cluster infections on the cluster stems, which generally don't become vulnerable until about two, maybe three inches of shoot growth. And we really start to see those inflorescences clearly um, separating from the, the, you know, the little tiny shoot. Um, and even at that stage, they can be still pretty hairy and, and uh, uh, hydrophobic to a point where, it, you know, phomopsis might have some difficulty infecting that young shoot. Uh, but under the right conditions, like we had in 2017, it was the perfect storm. So, <clears throat> We're basically, the long-winded, uh, I guess, story is that um, that three to five, three to six inch shoot growth stage is very important. We should consider that as essential as our 10 to 12 inch shoot spray and our, our pre-bloom spray, things like that. Uh, but again, it's mainly for phomopsis. Um, and it's mainly to protect the inflorescences. The, the good thing about 2017 that came out of it is the fact that it was one to two inches of growth. We did see shoot infections on the first, second internode that were really pretty bad in a lot of places. And it was widespread, more widespread than I've ever seen any epidemic before. But it didn't get really in most places to the to the inflorescences, so it didn't do a lot of cluster damage, and we didn't see a lot of, at least not in most of the vineyards I looked in uh, at the end of the season, didn't see a lot of uh, fruit rot that can result from those early cluster stem infections. So, oddly enough, you know, putting that spray on months ahead of of veraison, uh, can affect uh, fruit rot, uh, you know, all the way in uh, developing in September. Those, those sprays in, in early May, late April can, can affect your, your crop all the way into September. Well, and, and the reason is if they, if they get infected like that, um, like Brian said, you, you, you start to see the results of that, you know, uh, pre-harvest, but actually you get those infections and they'll sort of remain latent. They'll sort of go to sleep, but they're still there waiting for the right conditions. So if you get infections early like that, um, you may think, ah, it's no big deal, but then those infections for phomopsis will kick in. And if you get it in the pedestal, you know, what'll happen is, you know, during pre-harvest, it'll go from the pedestal into the berry. Or, or, you know, you may just use, uh, you know, shoulders because a uh, uh, shoulder stem was, uh, was infected and it might 
just dry up and then that shoulder will drop off and you might not even notice that. But I think Wayne had done some work that showed uh, that those infections where they dropped those that shoulder uh, from the Concords and the Niagara's, it, it really had an effect on the yield. So, yeah. um, Do you want me to show you some of those pictures I've got, Andy? Um, yeah, you can. And, and I was, um, what I was thinking about is you doing some of that. Um, and on my end, I can go through maybe at the end and show some of these pictures or if guys want to see it as we go along. But um, my Zoom skills sometimes aren't the best. So, <laughs> you but can Brian, do it. yeah, that would that would be good to show them what the phomopsis. Yeah, why don't I? I'll share my screen here, um, and hopefully, can you see that? Click that. Yes, we can see it. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, I just. Can you, you, um, can you mute, please, Kate? Sorry. What's that? I was just handling somebody who was um, unmuted by accident. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I just I, I thought I'd just show you. I mean, you guys know what this stuff looks like. This is uh, pretty bad phomopsis on a on a concord shoot. You can see it's bitten off the first two leaves even, and probably will might even bite up bite off that third leaf if it gets infected uh, heavily enough. Here's another good example of the first two internodes. This is the kind of stuff we saw in 2017. Um, fortunately, the inflorescence was up about another internode and seemed to escape most of the damage. But here you can actually, I don't know if you see my cursor. I think this is, uh, this is a cluster coming off right at this, right at this internode. And it looks like it might have escaped the damage, most of the damage. Uh, but if we look at this shoot here, this is some pretty horrific damage on a, a early inflorescence. Um, you can see that you know what phomopsis can do. A bit, a bit of, not, not only the first like three leaves, but um, even parts of the of the inflorescence. Early. Early. Right. Right. Well. Yeah. Well. And, and Brian, that, that picture to the right with the bud swollen and the cane. Yeah, this is what you'll be seeing right now. <laughs> right. This was a, a shoot that was affected last year. It's overwintered on it. It's lignified now, early spring. These buds are about to pop. This is Chancellor, which is incredibly, uh, the shoots are incredibly susceptible to Phomopsis. Uh, it's worse than I think than Concord. Uh, but these are practically doomed uh, unless they get a mancozeb spray these shoots are going to have it's just going to repeat the whole scenario and you're going to see you know this stuff on all these shoots next year uh, or you know later on in the in in the season and when we talked about cultural practices and pruning i mean if you have some choices <laughs> um and all your shoots aren't like that you know you'd take out this one. <laughs> so that's what we mean about, you know, as best possible when you're out there pruning, you know, make sure something like this as compared to a, another shoot that, uh, you know, maybe has less or none, try and um, take out some of that inoculum uh, during pruning. That's one cultural practice. I think that's all the, yeah, there it is again, just to, and so anyway, I'll take that out of there. Now, I don't, I don't think we have, we may have, well, we do have a, a couple of growers here, I guess that maybe have some vinifera. Um, so, you know, that one, uh, the three to five inch stage, um, really it would be vinifera for powdery mildew at this time. Only, you know, only if you have a highly susceptible variety like vinifera um, for powdery mildew. And the pressure was really heavy, especially at the one inch stage. And the pressure was really heavy the season before. Then, you know, uh, you might even think about at the one inch stage, putting on something for powdery um, or, or at the three to five inch stage, um, you know, 
putting something on for powdery if you have those highly susceptible varieties. Uh, yeah. But, but um, for Concords and Niagara's, you know, we don't even have to consider that that early. I mean, Brian, with that three to, I mean, generally like guys in the Southeast or Finger Lakes, they're probably by the three to five inch stage putting on, um, you know, especially if they have the Nifra, something for powdery. I would think a lot of guys would be. Yeah, yeah, and it's, you know, it's warranted for something like that that's just super susceptible to powdery mildew. And like you said, especially so if they if they had a big problem with it, it got out of control the previous year and they know they've got a lot of inoculum surviving the winter and firing up, you know, infection cycles at a to a greater extent early in the season. So and you know, you don't have to you don't have to use really expensive stuff, uh, a sulfur spray, you know, with just a few pounds at that time might be all you need at, at that point. So, and that's about it for that timing, I guess, you know, juice grapes, we're just looking at phomopsis. We're just concerned about phomopsis at that point in time. We get into 10 to 12 inch shoot stage, um, you know, that's when, Black rot might be a concern. Um, Brian, before we hit that, um, since we're at the three to five inch, I'm going to jump in just, just to mention the, about the banded grape bug. Okay. okay. Because of, about that stage is when, um, is when uh, you should be out scouting for the banded grape bug. And that's one of them that uh, I guess I could, I'll, I'll put my uh, <laughs> pictures of these things if you want to see them at the end. Uh, so, so that we're not jumping back and forth and I don't screw something up here. And <laughs> you won't screw anything up, Andy. If you just share your screen, we'll be able to see them and then you can okay. unshare. Let me, let me see if I can do just this. click that green share button and then. Yeah, I know, but I wasn't getting beforehand. I wasn't getting it on my screen and okay, let me, uh, just look on your other monitor. Yeah, that's what I'm is doing. That, is that monitor. file open on your computer? Yeah. Um, okay, here we go. Let me do that. Do that. And then I will share the screen. Let's see. Do you see the... Is that in... Do you see the banded grape book? Mm -hmm. Yes, if you okay. want to do um, view, this, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so and that's not, this is a little bit dark here, but this is what that um, insect looks like here on this flower cluster. And it has a banded antenna, uh, white, and, white and dark uh, bands on the antenna and also on the legs. And then this is what this other insect uh, Ligochorus it doesn't have a common name like the banded grape bug, but this Ligochorus inconspicuous looks like, and it's a little smaller than the banded grape bug. But both of them do the same thing. They have these piercing, sucking mouth parts, and at very early stage, they'll e either start feeding on the rachis or even the flower buds. And um, you know, uh, if you have enough of them, you can get crop loss. Greg uh, Loeb did uh, some some work here. And if, if you're out scouting and you see, you know, more than one nymph per 10 shoots, then you could suffer some crop loss. So we have had guys that have sprayed for this in the past and, and it doesn't occur every year. And generally I would, I would look, uh, say, uh, closer to border rows near the woods and things like that. It could occur throughout the vineyard, but um, at, at least look at those areas and they're hard to see. So what you're going to have to do is sort of go, go out, uh, grab a shoot tip or, or the flower clusters. And if you have a, like a white sheet of paper underneath and tap the cluster of the shoot and they'll fall out onto the, uh, onto the piece of paper. Um, again, I have seen, uh, in certain years, numbers enough that, that guys were concerned about and should have been and they spray. But again, it, it, it's intermittent pest. If it occurs in enough numbers, it, 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 you know, it would warrant a spray. But you, again, you have to be out scouting and you have to look close. And um, 
you know, as my eyes get worse and worse, it gets tougher to see these guys. But like I said, if you tap a cl uh, flower cluster or you tap a uh, shoot tip, that's where they'll usually be. And um, they should drop out onto the, the paper. So that's what the, that's what the banded grape bug and the liga course look like. So I will stop my screen share. And why don't we go on to then the, uh, the uh, 10 to 12 inch, Brian? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, at, at 10 to 12, of course, we're, we're throwing black rot in there now into the mix, especially if you've had problems and where you've seen some of it in the previous year, you've got mummies in the trellis, uh, anything like that. I did want to share, let me share my screen again. Um, and just to show you, of course, some nice pictures of mummies there. Um, <clears throat> everybody, can you see that? Yep. Yeah, okay. Here's what it looks like on leaves. Um, this is what, you know, when you're scouting early in the season at that 10 to 12 inch stage or earlier, actually, uh, you might see something like this. And if you do, if you, this is a good picture I, I wanted to show. Uh, this is on Concord, black rot lesions on a leaf right in the fruit zone. There's a, an inflorescence coming right off at that same node. This is a big red flag. Um, and if you do your scouting early enough, um, it can alert you to the fact that uh, not only do you have an inoculum source on that vine somewhere, probably a clump of mummies uh, is what started these leaf lesions, but these leaf lesions now, about two weeks after they become infected, um, they'll start to show up 10 to 14 days after infection, and then they'll start releasing spores. And of course, you know, during rainfall, spore sources just inches away from these inflorescences, which are extremely susceptible once bloom begins. Um, it's gonna be awfully hard. If you got a lot of these things, it's gonna be awfully hard to, to control the, the disease even with timely sprays. So you wanna prevent a situation like this. And at, at least, at the very least, when you scout, uh, you know, look for something like this and, and become aware of it. If it's, if it's out there, you need to know. Uh, and that's a kind of a high alert to be very vigilant about um, not only your 10 to 12 inch spray, but, but especially your immediate pre-bloom and your first post-bloom spray. Um, so anyway, just wanted to show that. Here's a bunch of other pictures of black rot. We see how it develops. It's a very easy disease, I think, to uh, identify for most of you, it starts out at this little spot of chocolate milk on green berries. And of course, we're talking here about the, uh, you know, early post bloom period. It eventually uh, encircles the entire grape, colonizes it, turns it brown, and then they dry down to these little mummies that are uh, very potent um, sources of inoculum. So um, take that off of there. <clears throat> so at 10 to 12, you know, you can start thinking about black rot in, in most cases, I think, unless you've been keeping things really clean. Um, but again, that immediate pre-bloom spray is also going to be extremely important for controlling the disease on your, on your fruit. You want to prevent those early leaf infections, um, especially the ones in the fruit zone on, you know, nodes three to five or whatever. Uh, leaves are only gonna be infectable by this pathogen, or I should say, you're only gonna get lesion development from infections on leaves that are expanding, that are infected while they're expanding. And so, you know, when are those leaves at nodes two, three, four, five expanding? Very early in the season. Once they're fully expanded, uh, they're, they're not going to show any lesion development. They, even if they get infected beyond that, the, the infection is going to remain microscopic and they're not a problem. So if you're seeing, if you're going out, you know, later 
in a few weeks from now and you're seeing uh, infections in the fruit zone or on those very first nodes on leaves, you're seeing, you know, those tan lesions. That means that you've got a source of black rot in your vineyard and it got through during the very early uh, pre-bloom period, probably, you know, six to 10 inches of shoot growth. Uh, and it's something that you need to be aware of and, and might be something that you need to manage closely for the rest of the season. At this point, Brian, um, as far as the, the, the materials, Mancazeb, Zyra, and Captain, you want to mention, I just wanted to sort of throw in about Captain not being, at least for black rot, not yeah. being, you know, uh, as effective. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, right now we can, in the pre-bloom period, a lot of the processors for juice grapes are allowing Captain use. And it might be cheaper in some cases than using Mancazeb. I don't really see any reason for using Zyrum pre-bloom. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the choice between Captan and Mancazeb could be important, like Andy said, because if you've got a black rot problem, um, the Captan is not going to be as, as efficacious as, as the Mancazeb. The Mancazeb will be the, the go-to product for vineyards that have had problems with black rot early in the season for early season sprays. Uh, and, and one of its weaknesses. And that's what I want. Now I think we'll grab Kevin in here to see if, um, you know, as far as maybe prices, um, Mancazeb, Captan, I mean, Zyram, have you one yeah. more expensive or what? Yes. Captan is usually cheaper in the, you know, I guess if you're comparing apples to apples, that that um, wettable powder format. Uh, a few guys have complained about captan use and switched to liquid. And in that case, um, it's probably still cheaper, but not very much cheaper than Manzate uh, or, you know, Manzate Pro Stick or certainly something a little more generic than Manzate. Um, so you will save a decent amount. I mean, you're going to go from probably, and it's going to depend on what rates you use, but if you use like a half rate of either one, you're going to be, you know, under $10 and under $5 probably. Uh, Captan has gone up a bit in price more than Manzate has for whatever reason this year. So that gap has closed a little bit. You know, it probably makes sense if it works in your sprayer and you want to bother with multiple materials to start with Captan at that three inch spray. If you know you're going to get something on by 12 or 14 inches. So occasionally I've seen growers do a three inch spray and, you know, if the weather's great and things are growing fast, sometimes that 10 to 12 inch spray becomes a pre-bloom spray, like right before pre-bloom. Uh, I don't think you, I mean, that's probably never ideal, but I think you should be a little less flexible when you're using Captain in that three inch. So you lose some flexibility. But if you want to start out with Captan and you're still going to buy a pallet of Manzate anyway, so it's it's not a big deal for you, you can do that in the three inch spray and save a little bit of money. Um, but it's not it's not critical. It's not like you're going from a twenty dollar material to a two dollar material or anything like that. So we see both guys we see guys doing both things. The one thing I would say is black rot is easy to control if you spray for it, and we did see some black rot black rot uh, come up as the processor started allowing captan. I don't know how extreme people went with their use of captan. Like, is that all they used in the pre-bloom period? Um, but, you know, I think nobody, nobody was really spraying for black rot. When they filled out their, their card, they were targeting other diseases and they just happened to be catching black rot because it's, it's harder to control Phomopsis and powder, you know, they're out there with powdery mildew and putting something in for Phomopsis and they're controlling black rot. So until Captan became available for use in juice grape processing, it was kind of gone for a while. I mean, I know in the nineties, black rot was a thing because materials and programs were a lot different then, but, but for my career, you know, since I started here in early two thousands, black rot was not, really a thing in Concord's unless, you know, 
Yeah, we see a lot of black rot when we start doing the vineyard improvement program because we're wandering through abandoned vineyards with, you know, poison ivy six feet high. But but in commercial vineyards that are well taken care of, it was pretty easy to control black rot. And, you know, even that 10 inch spray recommendations were really focused on, uh, you know, if you were rehabbing something, you might need something more serious than an EBDC or something like that to make sure you get coverage that doesn't wash off. But for the most part, control was really easy with EBDC. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't abandon it for $5. Yeah. Um, and that's the reason I, I brought that up. Um, because, and what was it, two or three years ago, I think that, that Mancazeb prices were up and Captain was cheap. And we did see some guys, and in, 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 I had one guy in particular just use Captain, didn't use any Mancazeb. And he, he got a vineyard that he didn't know about and he bought it and he didn't know what the situation was the year before and he put the he put the sprays on and he used captain and he he got hammered so i mean that's an instance that it, it's it's i would say rare for most guys because and, and like you said at the three to five if you've been controlling it you have good control but if you if you got it bad um just be aware that Captain is would be too weak. I would I would use the Mancazeb. So in, in a situation like that. We do have a question in the chat box, and that was, are the dollar values stated per acre? Kevin. The dollar values of what? That's just the question that says for, for I the material. I think he's for the materials. Are you is that per acre that you go? Yeah, yeah. So that I mean, it's a little tough with Captain and EBDC in that those really early sprays because you can get more and less aggressive with your rates. But um, you know, with EBDCs, you're looking at anywhere from probably th you know uh, six dollars to sixteen dollars an acre, depending on how you're buying it and what your rates are. So you can go all the way down to two pounds and go all the way up to four. You can buy in bulk, or or you don't have to. Uh, with Captan, I, I, if I recall correctly, you can't be quite as aggressive on your rates. It's not like you go from um, 1.25 to uh, to four pounds. Um, it it does so the Captan. Most guys use the 80, uh, the 80, which has more active ingredient in it. So you're not even using that two pound rate. Uh, it's actually lower than that, um, but typically in that early pre-bloom spray, if you're pretty aggressive and you've got good coverage or you're not using anywhere near a full rate, you'd be under $5. Um, I'd have to go and look and see what the full, full rate is and what that would cost because I don't typically look at that because I, I don't think you ever need a full rate at a three inch spray. And I, I don't think it would be a good idea to spray the full rate immediately pre-bloom. So there's a cost to that it's probably around nine dollars um but I, I i didn't look it up for this meeting because it's not something i think you guys or i would recommend so so you're probably comparing something like eight or nine dollars to something like five in those early sprays please feel free to keep asking questions that you might have and if you don't want to ask them out by unmuting Put them in the chat box. If you want to ask them anonymously, then direct them directly to me and I'll get them asked for you. Hey, I just had a comment. This is Jamie Militello. Um, one caveat, uh, a caveat of Captan, uh, especially when you're at the 10 to 12 or immediate pre-bloom, um, is that you can't use it with stylet oil. And, um, you know, I know that's something that I, it's a mainstay for me that I, I use that in those two sprays before bloom. So that's another thing. It's not just the cost. It, it's, you can't use that product with it. So that's another thing to think about. Yeah. I don't, and that's I don't know if we'll get into it, but just so we don't forget, that's not the only material that's like that. Um, like I said, I don't think a lot of people use Captan immediately pre-bloom. Maybe they do, um, but that's a good reason not to. Uh, Vivando would be one where you want to stay away from at certain times of the year, stay away from stylet oil. And um, that's a really common one where I think we've had some growers combine those and have some issues with it um, because the timing work fits. 
it would be when you would use both of those materials. Mm -hmm. So yeah, read the, read the label. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a good go point. Ahead, Kevin, go. Could you, or one of you guys, could you talk about what is being seen with Stylet Oil and Vivando together? Um, because I do use that a lot and I've never really seen anything, but I might not know what I'm looking for. So if, could you guys talk a little bit about that, what's been seen? I haven't seen with the Vivando and the Stylet. I don't know if you have, Brian, or... or... No, not, that's not something I'm really familiar with, but I, like Kevin said, I've, I've heard that there may be some issues with that. I've never personally um, seen like a leaf burning or anything like that or some kind of, of a fight. As, as I recall, it was damage to the flower. And I think it turned up in research at first. Um, but where I saw it, it really just looked like too high of a rate of stylet oil. So it looked very similar to what you'd see when you put on just too much stylet oil, not enough water. Yeah. A vine and, kind of and shutting down I, for a little bit. I think if, if everything you look at, they say don't go beyond the 2% um, with the stylet. And, and early on, really, you know, you don't need to use more than one, one and a half percent during that pre bloom period. I wouldn't use a 2% solution, really. Um, but stylet oil, you know, it's a nice, it's a, it's a good material for powdery mildew early on, uh, especially on varieties where you can't use sulfur. Um, I don't know how cost effective it is because I haven't really done much work on it for quite a few years now. But um, at that one to one and a half percent rate, it's a good eradicant to use in the pre-bloom period for powdery mildew. So. And that's a real good point that you brought up, Jamie, was, you know, with the captain yeah, and right. the stylet. Glad you mentioned that. And that's the same with the, the sulfur, too. Sulfur and stylet on either end um, that you have to be careful about. If, you know, if you have, you know, think about Niagara's or, or if guys have uh, wine grapes that they're going to be using sulfur and stylet in their program, you have to be aware of those things. So that, that was a good point to bring up. Uh, what about the, uh, well, we're talking about costs. Uh, do you have any idea, Kevin, or um, cost-wise? What are we talking about? Stylet oil? Stylet oil. Uh, I didn't get a price on that this year yet. Okay. I didn't ask. Well, Jamie, do you? <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, off the top of my head, it's usually typically around a 10 to $11 per acre. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. Now, you're talking, you're talking like a one and a half yeah, I usually do a one and a half, like at the 10 to 12. And that's a whole nother issue I want to talk to you, Brian, about. But but the other one is immediate pre I'm depending on weather, the weather situation, if, you know, the risk is high for powdery, I'll be using the 2%. Um, otherwise, at um, you know, earlier than that in the, in the spray season, it would probably be like one or one and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend just using stylet oil for that immediate pre -bowl. Oh no, no. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. If, if you yeah. don't mind, I don't want to hog the meeting, but I, I have a question of, a, and it's kind of in practicality of putting these sprays on and pre-bloom of, of what I've run into. And, mm -hmm. um, when I, I worked pretty close with Rick Dunst um, after he retired from the lab and, um, you know, I, I would always, at my three to five inch stage, I would be putting a material, a systemic material for powdery mildew. And he, you know, he kind of looked at me funny and said, what are you wasting your money for? You don't really need it at this time. And so I, started to take it out. Um, and the problem I, I have in practice and maybe some other larger growers have is, okay, I, I'm targeting that three to five inch stage, but then the vines will blow through to almost immediate pre-bloom and I've only got that man kazeb on. And now I'm putting on an immediate pre-bloom, you know, whatever, Vondo, Stylet Oil, uh, man kazeb. And I already have powdery mildew infections. 
And it, because it wasn't practical for me to get over the acreage at that 10 to 12 stage when I needed to, because we just, things grew so fast. So I just want to get your opinion on, I kind of scrapped what Rick told me and nothing against Rick, you know, but what I started doing is I, I backed my spray up my first one more to like the five to 10 inch shoot stage, put my first man Kazeb on then put stylet oil. And then I'm using a product like Torino there. Then I'm coming back right immediate pre bloom with again, man Kazeb, the Vondo stylet oil. My thinking is, okay, I've got that Torino it's systemic. I guess one of the questions for you, Brian, is do you, I mean, I'm seeing it work. So I, 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 I'm looking more for a verification, but one of the questions is how long does that Torino stay in the vine to give me that protection? Um, is it, is it protecting me into that 12, 15 inch shoot stage? Um, you know, when infections begin to happen. Um, but I've been doing that for the last two years. I don't know if it's just luck or the weather, but it seems to be working and I have a lot less incidence of powdery. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with, I agree with both you and Rick. <laughs> uh, and the reason is, I think, you know, what, what Rick was saying, surely at three to five inches, and if we're talking about Concords here, that, that's what you're talking about then yeah, you, you don't need anything for powdery mildew on concords at three to five inches. Um, but in your situation, because of the way your production is set up, you can't get in there to put another spray on before that immediate pre-bloom, then yeah, what you're doing now, targeting that six to 12 or six to 10 inch stage, um, that's what you need to do to get that eight to 12 inch spray on um, or at least get one spray on for powdery mildew before you put that immediate pre-bloom spray. So, so yeah, I mean, you figured out what you needed to do for your individual farm um, in order to get two powdery mildew sprays on before bloom uh, in order to get adequate control of the disease on your, on your conkers. Um, and, you know, maybe, I don't know if Rick didn't realize that, but I mean, he's right. You don't need a spray at three to five inches. But like you said, if, if you have to not shoot for the 10 to 12, but six to 12 or six to 10 to get that second spray or that uh, to get two pre-bloom sprays on, then that's what you got to do. And it's working. It's working for you. So how long will, if you're getting that Torino on at like the six inch stage, how long will that stay in the, is it systemic that it's in the vine? Well, it, it's, it's Torino like, should be, yeah, Torino should be pretty, uh, should be pretty rain fast. Uh, as far as I know, Torino is pretty rain fast. Okay. Um, and it should give you, I would think at least, especially at that point in time too, um, you know, 10 to 14 days of protection. Now, it's not, to my knowledge, it's not going to move from growth that you hit at six inches to growth that's at 12 inches. Okay. Uh, so you're still, the problem with those early sprays are, you know, unless something is is uh, completely systemic, like, uh, like a phos acid material, it's not going to move to that new growth. It just isn't. Even, even sterile inhibitors, which, you know, are locally systemic, where they might move from the top of a leaf to the bottom of a leaf or something like that, across a few cell layers, um, they're not going to move from one cluster or one leaf to another. What you hit is what you're going to protect, and that's it. Uh, so to my knowledge, Torino isn't, you know, a Torino spray at six inches is not going to protect um, your growth uh, 12 inches out, you know, five days later. Uh, it's going to be unprotected. And it, it's just the nature of the beast. You know, when you're going through those early growth stages that quickly, you're putting on an inch or two of growth a day. Um, you just, you do the best you can to get those sprays on. 
Um, and, you know, you might even consider, um, and, and this is just throwing out an idea here, that if, if you're having problems with powdery mildew, you might want to, between that six to 10 and pre immediate pre-bloom, if you can, you might put on a, you know, uh, even a, like a neutral spray or something like that, if that's cost effective. The material doesn't cost a lot, but, you know, that's an extra application. But you're putting it on, you know, seven days after your six to 10 inch spray and seven days before your immediate pre-bloom spray. Um, you know, something to think about. Okay. Yeah, I would. I, I guess it seems to be hard for, to manage. I mean, as a long term strategy, um, at most, I would think, you know, if you never park your sprayer, you want to be able to be able to spray three times between three inches of shoot of shoot growth and immediate pre-bloom. And in some years, that's really easy because things are slow. And that's usually when disease pressure is the highest. You know, if we get to three inches in, of shoot growth down to bloom in, in, you know, two weeks, there probably wasn't a lot of disease pressure because, you know, it was warm and sunny. But, you know, if it takes you seven or eight days to get through your acreage, the long-term strategy should probably be a bigger sprayer or more sprayers. And in general, a bigger sprayer is going to make sense because eventually sprayer operators are going to be making 30 to $40 an hour. So that would just be my long-term strategy. Uh, let Brian handle how you do with it, you know, how you deal with that until you get to that point where, you know, it makes sense to replace a sprayer because it usually doesn't make sense to go out and buy a new sprayer if you just bought a new sprayer kind of thing. And you no, know, right. I'm a heady. I got another multi-row coming. So we'll have two go. So. Yeah, so you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. How long does it take you to get through your acreage? For me, if it's, you know, the weather's good and we could go every day at about five days. Yeah. Um, but again, that was with one multi-row and one conventional. And so, you know, my thought was, okay, you know, just everything Kevin just said about increasing wages you know i invested in another multi-row that i can do my double curtain with and so in reality we ought to bring that down to you know four days now and to get the 300 acres done and um you know so then yeah then i i should be able to get back to doing the three sprays yeah but, that'll buy you some flexibility in that yeah I'm sure there's other on others on the call that probably have the same issue, you know. So. Oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I think you can go as long as five or six days, but it really depends on how your farm is set up because sometimes <laughs> sometimes five days is like um, it, it's really only two days different because you go you start in the early stuff and you move to the late stuff. But if you've got a lot of stuff in one spot and you know maybe you're slow to spray GDC because oh. you only have a single row oh, there. Wow. Um, it, it does get, become a lot to manage for some of the larger growers to try to figure out how to get through that acreage, even if it only takes them five days and you need to be at three or four uh, to, to hit your target sometimes, so. Well, we're still at the 10 to 12 inch shoot growth. This is, <laughs> this is, a, it is cold well, weather. So we're not... season. We'll, we'll have more <laughs> meetings. I mean, that's good. That's, that's good. That's I, was gonna, I was going to say, let's get through bloom and then we can just have a post bloom. Yeah. We do this well, by the, <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm hoping we'll get through at least a post bloom and that should take us to the moon. But, um, and Andy, again, this is a perfect segue for us to uh, promote the coffee pot meetings, which unfortunately are all virtual again this year. And you can get one credit for New York State and PDA, and that's timely. We'll talk about what's going on right then and now. Those are yeah. every Wednesday from 10, every third Wednesday of the month, we're putting an evening session in this year. It's gonna be from seven to nine for those who cannot take time out of the day to break off and come to see us. But other than that, they're gonna be the 10 to 12 time every Wednesday through May, June, and July. That was a good segue. But yeah, so, you know, whatever we don't cover, we won't get the whole season, but, you know, I'd rather cover the questions that you guys have, uh, like I said, rather than just trying to get through everything, because we have all those coffee pots where we'll be talking about all that stuff.
Yeah. So. And you've got, you guys have heard a lot of this stuff already before <clears throat> for the last 20 years, 30. <laughs> but um, I did want to mention, you know, 10 to 12 inches, of course, that's, that's when we want to start thinking about downy mildew also. Actually, it's like the five to six leaf stage, you know, that's when your first downy mildew sprays need to go on, uh, especially for susceptible varieties. If you're using Mancazeb, um, you know, then you're you're covered, you know, using Mancazeb for black rot and, and Phomopsis, you're also covered for downy mildew for most varieties, um, you know, except maybe a sensitive vinifera or something like that. If it's really, really wet, you might want to tank mix something else in there too. But, <clears throat> you know, for juice grapes, that Manzate spray or even a Captan spray might be enough. Xyrum is going to be a little, that downy mildew is one, is, is Xyrum's weakness. And so and we generally don't use Xyrum till the post bloom period anyway, but just thought I'd mention that. So, and of course, Phomopsis is still important at 10 to 12 inches. You can still get um, cluster rachis infections, but again, you're using, you're putting Mangazeb or Captan on, you're gonna be well covered for Phomopsis. So, so we can jump into the pre-bloom spray if you want now. Um, well, I just wanted to mention um, at this stage, uh, you type a dieback. You know, we, don't, we have, haven't talked about that. that, that should be visible by this stage and, and really clear, you know, uh, just jump out at you if you're out there scouting. So uh, again, just wanted to throw that in there that about this stage, it should be easy to see. And um, you know, those, those symptoms, you have the uh, stunted shoots, the leaves are cupped and yellowed. I think you guys have all, all seen it. Um, you know, and, and now's a, uh, period where you either flag it and you take it out after harvest uh, or, you know, take it out at this point. And, um, you know, if you're going to be cutting it out uh, about six to eight inches below the canker is where you'd want to, you know, how you want to prune it out. But if, if you, you know, you could, like I said, flag it and then take it out later, but just make sure you don't flag it and then don't take it out because, uh, you know, that's one thing. If you're going to, if that's the way you're going to manage it, then, you know, make sure that you, you continue and, and keep up on it. Otherwise you could just take it out, you know, those arms, uh, when you see it. So that would depend, but I just wanted to at least mention that cause that would be, it's, it's really visible at this time. Uh, you wait too much longer as a canopy fills in and you're just not going to see it. It just, you know, Growth is too heavy and, and you lose it. So uh, when you're out there scouting, be looking for that. Banded grape bug is still at this point, uh, the nymphs, and that could still be a problem. Uh, once you get to about pre-bloom, um, in the bloom, uh, the nymphs change to adults and the adults are actually uh, predators, predaceous. So it's the nymphs we worry about early in the season for banded grape bug in the Ligochorus. So, yeah, I think now we could go to the immediate pre, unless there's questions. Or Kevin or Jen, you guys, do you guys have anything to jump in with before we <clears throat> hit the immediate pre? No, do you want to show any of your slides to back up anything that you've been stating? Uh, no, we could probably maybe do that with the immediate pre-bloom and post-bloom with some okay. slides. Unless I don't. I didn't put up a Utypa here. Um, I couldn't find it. I have them, but I couldn't find it. And it was right before we had a start. So <laughs> okay. I didn't have a shot of that. But uh, I did want to mention, uh, I mean, that 10 to 12 inch stage is a good one to scout for black rot. If you've been having problems with it, um, you're going to see it at that point. And like that picture I showed you, um, leaf which are real easy to spot, real easy to, very diagnostic and, and easy to identify. That, you know, that'll, that'll give you a good warning that 
there's a potential problem brewing and you really need to stay on top of your pre your immediate pre-bloom spray is going to be that much more important, especially for things like black rot. So I don't know of too many guys that have had, been having problems with it lately, but I know there's, I know there's a few, there's a few out there. Uh, we've had some hot, dry Junes and Julys for the past several years and not too many problems with black rot that I've seen, but uh, there are, there are a few. So, so moving on, I guess, into immediate pre-bloom. Might as well talk about immediate pre-bloom and, and first post-bloom um, sort of at the same time, because okay. I think those, those two sprays are, if you're going to spray at all, <laughs> in any given season, and uh, those are the two sprays you got to put something on. Uh, you've, especially if you've delayed your, your powdery mildew sprays on Concord until, uh, you know, immediate pre-bloom, that's, that's when that, first spray absolutely has to go on for powdery mildew and then follow it up with a first post bloom spray within 10 to 14 days. And you now every year we go through this where we talk about using your best materials, you know, making sure you're going every row, good coverage. Um, you know, I know I, I sound like Mr. Obvious, but <laughs> it's something we got to talk about every year and, and because a lot of times we see problems where guys end up with too much fruit damage and it's because they either stretched the interval between those two sprays too much or they didn't use the right materials, um, didn't use the right gallonage. It could be in any number of things, but that's when you want to do everything, you know, to the best of your ability, uh, good coverage and so forth. I want, wanted to just jump in real quick with the coverage, Brian, you know, before these early sprays, you know, obviously, and we're not the ones that are paying the bills for doing the spraying. Okay. So just take that into context, but you know, those early sprays, you know, we would like to see, put it this way, the, the best control uh, would be every row. I mean, uh, and Andrew Landers and Wayne did that where they compared every row versus but at that time, you know, you're blowing through the rows. There's not that much foliage. So again, practic practically, most guys are not spraying every row then. But when you get the immediate pre-bloom, you absolutely have to start spraying every row. You, you really do. Um, so, you know, most guys don't until then, but uh, there are growers that don't even do it then. And I would say that would be a big mistake, like Brian said, because of the critical period. So I'll just let yeah. you jump to that. And to kind of go along with that, I mean, I'm, I'm not belittling at all these previous sprays, you know, um, and that, you know, in most cases, you only have to apply a pre-bloom and a post-bloom. No, uh, the success of your pre-bloom and post-bloom spray is going to depend on your pre your earlier sprays, whether you put on that three to five inch, whether you put on that six to 10 or eight to 12 inch spray and how, you know, what kinds of materials you used and how well you did in terms of, of good coverage and, and every row and, and things like that. So, you know, you can try to gamble and, and not put anything on, for example, for powdery mildew until that immediate pre-bloom spray. But you're not going to get as good control, even if you do everything right during that immediate pre-bloom and first post-bloom spray, um, if you neglected to do anything before that. So, you know, all these things are insurance policies and they're cumulative. And the best way to control diseases, as always, has been, you know, hitting it hard and heavy up front early in the season and, and keeping those pathogen populations to a bare minimum as low as you can as low as you can practically keep them and that's going to that's going to create a situation where once you get into that immediate pre-bloom and for first post-bloom spray and you do a great job with it use good materials and 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 good coverage and everything your sprayers are working top notch you know you're going to go into that 
second post bloom period, looking at your crop and everything's going to look really, really good. Um, and you may be able to, you know, uh, let up a little bit easier uh, at that point. So everything you do up to these two critical sprays is going to make a difference as well. <clears throat> now, having said that, um, I, I did want to mention that we do have um, some new materials for powdery mildew coming online. Yeah. Um, one you've already heard of, which is called Sevia, that's in the guidelines. That was in the guidelines last year. It'll be in, the, in this year, of course, again. Um, but unfortunately, it, it's, a, it's a sterile inhibitor that's so far been really good on black rot. Um, I would say, you know, good to very good on powdery mildew. Again, it's a sterile inhibitor. So it's in that chemical class that's, you know, been out there for powdery mildew control for, for three decades or more, uh, more than that, actually. And so we're, you know, we're seeing slippage. So it's not something that um, I would use by itself, especially during this critical period. Uh, I just mention it because it's new. Um, the other cavity of cor caveat, of course, is simply the fact that you can't use it on juice grapes right now anyway. Uh, it's only for use on vinifera. If there's any vinifera growers here that um, are looking for something new, uh, that might be something you'd consider. If you're, you might use it in that immediate pre-bloom period, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it in and of itself on vinifera. I would definitely spray, spray it with sulfur added in there too. Uh, it will become available for use on all varieties in 2022. They, they have approved an expanded label already. Um, but none of the 2021 product is, is under that label. So uh, there won't be any use of that material for most of the guys in this audience right now. <laughs> but, uh, I just thought I'd mention it. Something to think about in 2022, maybe, if you're a juice grape grower. I don't know how it's going to be priced, but I'm thinking it's sort of on along the line of diphenaconazole. Um, which is a, you know, a sterile inhibitor that's probably more act that is more active than say tebuconazole, uh, especially on powdery mildew. Um, only of course di diphenaconazole you can't use on Concords. You know we had that debacle several years ago when it was first released, uh, and now it's prohibited on for use on Concord grapes. Um, We've been testing this new product, Sevia, on, on Concord grapes for a couple of years, have not seen any injury issues with it. So 2022, it looks to be good to go on, on juice grapes, something to, just something to think about. Um, I don't know, Kevin, if you were able to get any price on that material. Yeah, so uh, Sevia is right around just above $20 an acre. Uh, so that does put it a little bit above Revis top um, just a bit. So certainly practical considering it's labeled for multiple um, multiple diseases to use. Yeah. Uh, I guess my only question would be, you know, what's the efficacy of some of those others? We know Revis top works really well on powderies to this day, or at least from everything I've heard. Um, but it does have a Femopsis label, which Revis top is missing. And they both are, you know, effective at black rot control, I think. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. Like if you had Niagara's, would you spend an extra $3 on Sevia or absolutely not? Or what do you know? No. The short okay. answer to that is no. Um, because so would you not trust it with Femopsis, I guess would be the... No, it's it's because the Revis top has downy mildew activity and Sevia does not. Okay. So Sevia is a good product. It'll be comparable to... The diphenaconazole in Revis Top, but mm -hmm. Revis Top also has mandipropamid in it, which Sevia does not. It's not a combination material. Uh, I would stick with Revis Top. You know, okay. County mildew control, along with powdery and black rot control, and and probably a little bit of Femopsis control. Whereas with Sevia, we're only we're only looking at primarily powdery mildew and black rot. 
There's over. also a question in the chat box. I'm just going to read it out to you for whomever wants to answer that. And it says, Sovereign has, test has testing concluded. It is ineffective at this point in time. Do you see it in the chat box? Does anybody want to address that? That's about Sovereign? Sol Solver? Has testing concluded? Oh, has testing concluded it is ineffective at this point in time? Um, I suppose, Brian, there, he's talking about powdery and... and yeah, yeah, okay. And, and Sovereign. Uh, I, Sorry I, about the misspell. It is Sovereign. Yeah. Okay, I, okay, okay. I... You know, I definitely wouldn't use it at this time period. Um, I don't think anybody has, um, I don't think specifically they've tested that, Brian, as far as resistance, but uh, anecdotally, I mean, uh, quite a few growers uh, have said that, you know, they have definitely seen it slip for powdery mildew. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, jump in on that, Brian, because that's, I we collected, try. yeah, we collected powdery mildew isolates. We've been wanting to look at strobilurin resistance here in the Lake Erie region for, for some time. And I, I collected some isolates last year, and uh, Michigan State has set up a nice program to look at strobilurin resistance all over the country. Um, and they were accepting samples, and I went out and collected a bunch and uh, sent them in for uh, to have them look at it. And I, I have not heard back from them yet, but um, I suspect, I, I'm pretty sure there is uh, strobilurin resistance here as it is everywhere uh, at this point in time. I don't think it's as bad here in the Lake Erie region. I've, I'm not gonna go so far as to say that Sovereign doesn't work anywhere uh, in the Lake Erie region. It probably still does. Uh, and abound, you know, all the strobilurins. Flint is another one. Pristine's got a strobilurin in it. Um, but I would, I would not use it at this critical time, um, simply because we don't know if there's resistance. There's a good chance there's resistance, and if if there's resistance, it's going to be like throwing water on it. It's going to do absolutely nothing. It's not like. Uh, it's a different type of resistance than what we see with the sterile inhibitors, where um, we're seeing more of a quantitative resistance sterile inhibitors, where you can bump the rates up and get better control of powdery mildew. With strobilurins, no. Once there's resistance, once the population has become resistant, um, the control is just going to crash, and it's going to be as if you didn't put anything on. And you're gonna, it's gonna show. Um, so if, if you're gonna use something like that, um, you either have to. Number one, I I wouldn't use something like that for the immediate pre bloom and post bloom. But if you're going to, then I would at least tank mix it with something else um, that you know has activity against powdery mildew. Um, with Niagara's, of course, a good, great product would be sulfur. Um, Concord's probably, you know, you could tank mix it with almost anything else. But then what would be the point in putting Sovereign in there anyway? Yeah, I was just, if I could jump in real quick. Um, I think academically, it's really interesting to see if we have um, issues. But I think from a commercial standpoint, Sovereign doesn't really have a place in a program unless, you know, Jamie's got a fire sale on it, but it's yeah. too expensive right now to tank mix for what it's offering. Uh, I think we have a lot of good powdery mildew materials. I know Sovereign is supposed to pick up some of the other diseases, but we have other ways we can do that more yeah. effectively and a lot of times for less money. Uh, yeah. Maybe not, maybe more effectively in the pre and post, which is what we're talking about now, but, but less expensively later in the season. So I, I just don't see where it fits. And yeah, as a, I could chime in on that. Um, I agree with you, Kevin. Um, if you were going to use a strobilarin, it'd be generic. A bound would be your cheapest option. And I agree with Brian. I, I wouldn't and don't use it, you know, immediate or post bloom. I would push it out to, you know, a second or third post bloom. And I mean, 
at that point, you've already controlled the diseases. It's some of these other diseases that abound or control that, you know, you might get something with it. Again, I it's kind of like that. I'm not even sure why sometimes we use that because we'll put neutral with it or something like that. But it's more of a, you know, just the guy wants to put something on. He's already used the gamut of chemistries and we don't want to repeat it. So we'll recommend using that as more of a resistance management thing. Yeah, I mean, the only reason I think you used to even use Sovereign was in Pennsylvania, things are a little bit different. I think a bound was always better, but you have to be allowed to use a bound. Um, but yeah, I, I, there may be spots here and there because you've got some generic abounds where, so the price is a little bit different with a bound where a bound might fit in. Um, but yeah, I think Sovereign, it, it appears to me when I price price it, it usually commands a premium over a bound and it offers less. And we're already questioning whether we should ever use a bound. So it, it's pretty easy to me if, if I'm in Pennsylvania to just quit that chemistry altogether. Yeah. Well, and, and Sovereign was was the replacement for Pennsylvania growers for the abound. And that's right. why, and, and it worked very well on powdery yep. mildew when it first came out. But uh, just like Aaron, you know, so the two things with the immediate and the, and the post is, and again, Brian, jump in, but, you know, if you look in the guide or any of the research, you know, with the strobilorins, which are the, the frac group three and the, the um, DMIs, the sterile inhibitors, which are the frac group three, um, you know, the immediate pre and post stay away from, just because, you know, there's been documented resistance in those classes. And, you know, you might not know if you have it, but if you do, and you're only using that, like I said, then you, you're not gonna get control if you have resistance. And like Brian said, if you are doing that and you're not sure, make sure you tank mix, just like he said. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, the only thing I would ever recommend Sovereign for would be black rot, <laughs> but, you know, that's if you have absolutely nothing else to apply. And there's, there's cheaper materials for black rot that work just as well, if not better than Sovereign. So I think Sovereign has just kind of seen its better days and it's, it's out. Um, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't recommend it for powdery mildew control really anywhere at this point in time. So, so Brian, um, what, what are your like number one and two choices for pre-bloom and post-bloom? If it was your farm, what would you do at those sprays? Good question. Okay. Now, let's get into some new uh, and even another new material, <laughs> which uh, could be a really, you know, big, what we consider a big gun uh, that would be perfect for, especially like that first post-bloom uh, spray for powdery mildew. It's called Gatton. Uh, I believe it's got a registration. I think it's registered for it's got a federal registration, so it's good for Pennsylvania. I think it's even got a New York registration too, um, I believe. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at Katie Gold's little uh, treatise here on, on diseases. Thank you, uh, I was just trying to pull that up as you were talking yeah. about it. <laughs> she says it is labeled for use in New York as of the 2020 season. So even last year, uh, it might've come online late in the year or something, I don't know. But um, I have not tested it myself, but uh, New York has been testing it even when it was a numbered compound uh, sold by a different company actually at that time, by Valent. I think Nachino has picked it up now, yeah. but it's called Gatton and uh, it has provided excellent control of powdery mildew in all their trials. So I don't know what that material costs, but it, uh, could be a, a very good replacement for, you know, if you've been using Vivando, Quintec, something like that as your heavy hitter for powdery mildew uh, for that first post-bloom spray, it might be a, a good one to try in there, depending, of course, again, on cost too. Um, the other material that I'd like to mention again, uh, so that's Gatton. The other material would be Endura. 
which we've been kind of, you know, chatting about the last couple of years now since prices uh, on that material have gone down. Uh, Endura is an old fungicide, actually. It's been out for 20 years on grapes, but we really haven't, it's, it's in a class that we have not really been using on juice grapes. Uh, it's in the succinate dehydrogenase inhibitor, which is a, a FRAC7. And some other products you might recognize that have a FRAC7 in it would be things like uh, uh, the Luna products, Luna Experience, Luna Sensation, um, Miravis Prime, which probably none of you have used. Uh, those are newer ones. And Aprovia is another one as well. Aprovia and Aprovia Top. All of those materials would be excellent to use for powdery mildew uh, for that uh, for first or immediate pre-bloom, but especially that first post-bloom spray, which I think is probably the, the most important spray of the season for powdery mildew. So those are things to think about. Gatton, uh, brand new. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's in a, a mode of action, a frac class that we don't have anything else that we're using, uh, I think it's U, U13 or something like that, frac class. Um, we don't have any other products in that class, so it's brand new. It should work wonderfully. Um, again, I don't know how much it costs, but the other alternative would be Endura, which is Boscolid, frac seven. Um, but since old material, but since we have not used it much at all in juice grape culture, and it's been out for 20 years. It's very affordable um, at a four and a half ounce rate for powdery mildew. It should work very, very well. I expect it to work as well or better than Vivando and Quintec and be comparable in price, certainly to Vivando, probably a little more expensive than Quintec. Quintec is pretty cheap now. I think 12, 13 bucks an acre maybe for a four ounce rate. I was going to say, I'd call it comparable in common usage. All three are going to be in the same price point and Endura might come out okay. as the cheapest because most people, wow. are, whether they should or shouldn't use higher rates of Quintet. I'll leave that to you, but. Yeah. You know, well, that's not a bad idea. Um, what was that? I said when I, I I'll, I'll leave it to you whether they should or shouldn't, but in common practice, when I talk to growers, it seems like most of them are at least using that yeah, the lower high rate. So it's, I don't know if you've ever read the label and remembered it, but it's got a rate for it to last two weeks and a rate for it to last three. Yeah. I think it's a five ounce or five and a half ounce rate. It'd be a five. Yeah. I think it's a, 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 up around five ounces. I, I just, I thought I heard somebody else talking too, but I, Oh, sorry. But uh, no, that's all right. I, but uh, yeah, so that's, you know, those are things to think about. I, I would like I would to say, mention that. Brian, that unfortunately Gatton isn't in the guide this year. So mm -hmm. if guys are looking for that, um, Katie had a lot of that uh, information on the Gatton and we just, we just having to get that guide in and everything else that was not put in there. Also yeah. call, you know, if you're interested in Gatton, call your pesticide dealer a little early. Um, when I went to look for price, I do have a price on it that I found online, which is usually a more expensive way to buy it. So it's not a great price and they'll probably do better once they have access to it. But nobody had heard of it last week that I talked to. I didn't talk to Jamie. I talked to somebody who works for Jamie, but nobody had heard of it. Um, the price online is about $24 an acre. So once we start buying it in bulk, it should be something that's reasonably marketed towards Concord growers. I don't know if that will be this year. I don't know what the availability looks like. Um, but in the future, I think it'll be one of the material it, realistic. I wasn't sure when I heard about it, cause you never know if it's going to be $50 an acre or 10. Uh, but it sounds like in the future, it'll be something we use. Yeah, uh, this is news to me. Unfortunately, I, I should know about this, but I, it's the first I've heard of it. But, you know, I'll get on it. And, <laughs> well, know. if you look in the chat box, this is for anybody on here. I have put actually Katie Gold's a link to that her we call it the manifesto that she said out there. And that is her blog spot. And you can read it there. It was also in our newsletter that just went out this week. 
So if anybody has any information and need us to get further for you, you can look it up either there or we can email Katie and get that for you. And, and I don't think that most guys, like I said, I think like you were saying, Kevin, maybe the following year or whatever, or as more dealers get it. Usually when these materials come out, um, it's not that available. You know what I mean? In other words, uh, and, and the guys that usually use some of these newer materials would be maybe the wine grape growers, because a lot of times they're a little bit more expensive and things like that. So I think it'll be, it'll fit in as, as a good place for, for those two critical sprays, you know, either immediate pre or at least the immediate post, first post. Um, but I just want to touch on real quick, um, have guys seen, you know, we've got the Quintec and we've got the Vivando and basically the last couple of years, I think, Brian, we've been, those are the three at around that immediate pre first post we've been recommending for powdery um, for, for Concord growers. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody seen where it slipped enough that it, it wouldn't be effective? I mean, I've heard some growers say they think either Quintec or Vibondo isn't working as well. Um, I don't know if we have really any hard evidence on that or if it's slipped enough, if it has slipped at all, to worry about, at least at this point, with, say, Concord. The only thing I can add to that um, is that we have been running trials for the past two, three years now where we've, we've compared Vivando, Quintec, and Endura. Um, and every year, Endura has done better for, for powdery mildew control. So but, but that's now the, our location, you know. Okay, but with the Quintec and the Vivando, I mean, it's done better, but... Uh, better enough that that the grower would really be able to see the difference or that you'd worry that you, you probably not okay. yeah probably not because from you know practically speaking no no you know we're talking about maybe a a one percent difference in in fruit disease severity or something like that that wouldn't wouldn't probably be even noticed unless you you looked at a hundred clusters and rated everyone. And that's, that's what we do. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess that like you do. <laughs> For as we're splitting hairs, <laughs> that's what we do. We split hairs, but it, you know, I can say that Endura does look better, but from a practical perspective, not necessarily, but like Kevin says, it, prices being the same for all those materials, why not use Endura instead of, Vivando or Quintec, especially for that first post bloom spray. We've got about nine or 10 minutes left. So, and we've gotten through the, the meat first post bloom. So maybe we should see here, I did want to mention right at the end, at least mention spotted lantern fly, but is there anything else, say Jen or Kevin or Brian or any of the growers, especially questions? Um, before we. I wanted to also mention spotted lantern fly and discuss what we had to discuss, but um, I've been monitoring the chat box and I don't believe I've missed anybody's questions. I think we did put in Katie's, a link to Katie's online. If you have not or are not a member of the LERGP program, you can sign up. We put a link there for online for you to go to access and then also a link in the chat box for you to purchase the New York 2021 New York and PA pest management, pest management guidelines. So that's there for you. Um, I do have the poll that we have to do and I can put that up while we're talking about spotted lantern fly. If you are looking for credits, you need to answer the poll questions. So that is important if you are looking for credits and I don't want to take away from the spotted lantern fly talk. So, well, we, yeah, but we do have to, like you said, so why don't we do that first? And... Okay. I'm going to start the poll now. Kevin promised that he would sing the Jeopardy theme song. No, I didn't. Um, I do want to mention real quick. Um, I know we only got through post bloom, but only because it's a new chemistry. Um, Verdeprin is a new insecticide for grape berry moth. It has a very strange New York state label. 
in that it's somewhat restricted where you can use it. Um, certainly you can't use it in Nassau and Suffolk counties. You have to um, be 25 feet away from vegetated and non-crop buffer strips. Uh, let's see, it's a little confusing. A 25 foot vegetated non-cropped buffer strip tra untraversed by drainage tiles must be maintained in the treatment area. Um, but it's only gonna be used for spot spraying right now. It's about $40 an acre. So I don't see widespread use this year happening unless somebody's got a better price than that. Uh, but if you need another chemistry to do some spot spraying, it's there. Uh, I, I think, you know, in some of our really high risk areas, I would not eliminate that altogether as a possibility if I had a large crop and I needed to put on another good chemistry. Um, so that's the only thing I wanted to mention and you guys can get to the polling. Thank you, Kevin. So while you're doing the polling, I will just briefly mention to you what, what has been going on in New York State, and then we can show in some pictures and whatnot once I finish the polling. So it was on, well, let's see, April 14th, six days ago, that there was quite an effort that took place in Ithaca, New York. I, we brought to you last fall that they had found some egg masses in Ithaca, New York. The, it has been conflicting between whether there was one or nine. I heard as much as 11 that they found in the fall. However, they just had an effort. The New York State Ag and Markets had an, I don't know if I can share my screen while you're doing this. I'm going to at least try. Where they closed down. Can you see my screen and take this poll at the same time? Anyone? Because I do not want to take away from the poll. Kevin, it looks like you can, Jen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so they found um, a block in Ithaca that was trees were completely infested with spotted lanternfly egg cases. So they have closed the street down and are removing all of those trees that they found. I know this is kind of shock and awe to some people to remove all of the trees. And I was worried that was because we're obviously not there. What is the extent of this? So I asked people who are on campus. And they said it's actually a residential area. It's not like a wooded area. And there were, you know, between five to 10 trees in that area that they would be removing them all and chipping them up and getting them out of the way. So it grew from one to 11 egg masses in the fall to all of the trees on this block being completely infested with spotted lanternfly egg cases. We have been saying it for a long time that it's not if it gets here, but when it gets here. So I just would really like to also share with you some information that's out there. I don't know if this is the one you put in the chat box, Andy, no. but this is something that's been put out by Penn State. Thankfully, Penn State in the quarantine zone has had this infestation for quite a few years now and been able to actually do some research to help us out for when it does get here. Well, what I would like you to do, be very diligent while you're out and about to look for egg masses. And I have I just interrupt for one second. Um, yeah. The last question, did you hear about this meeting via text? A surprising number of you did. We don't have a extremely long database of people that we text. If you'd like to be added, you can add your name and cell phone in the chat box. Uh, it would probably be best if you just send that to Kate. So in the two, it should say everyone and you can select an individual. Um, Kate Robinson should be at least in mine, it's like the fourth or fifth name down and send that your cell and your name to uh, to Kate if you want to be added to that list. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Yep. I really would, would like you guys to be well known and versed in what an egg mass looks like. So I brought up some of the references that are out there for you. They can be covered. They can be half covered. You can all see the pointer correct here. These are all examples of the egg cases of the spotted lantern fly. They do not have a preference to where they lay them. They lay them on smooth trees. They lay them on rusty metal. They lay them on tires. They lay them on rocks. If you do happen to find one, I need you to know exactly what to do when you do find them. And 
that is, you need to take pictures of it here. You can see up here in this reported the spotted lantern fly. This is for New York State. I'm not sure where they're having you report for Pennsylvania. And I'm hoping Andy can help you with that. But if you're in New York, you need to take a picture and you need to have something in that photograph for scale, whether it's your hand so that they can see that. Then you need to collect the insect or, or the egg mass, put it in the freezer or an alcohol or hand sanitizer, note where you found it and email that information to New York Ag and Markets. And they are very diligent about coming out and surveying around the area because this pest is so invasive. So I'll stop that share. And this will all be in our crop update this week. So you can have that information there for you. And let me just, I'll just share the screen real quick here. And let me see. And can you see the screen there? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. So then that is, like Jen said, these are all the different life stages. Again, A is the egg mass. And then this is one to three uh, instar. This is the last instar. And then this is the adult. And then let's see if we got, and this is just egg masses on vineyard post and a, a adult female laying freshly laid egg mass. And then you have egg masses on um, a wire, uh, a um, post, metal post, and underneath the uh, great bark. And like Jen mentioned, they'll lay them anywhere. On tires, she mentioned, so they'll lay these eggs anywhere. Uh, and this is what down at a vineyard down the southeast, when the numbers start to build up, uh, probably, uh, I think they start like end of August, beginning of September, the adults. So yes, there's, um, there's, I'll stop sharing now. It's only in Pennsylvania. It is only one, two, three, four counties away, Allegheny County, which is Pittsburgh. And now it stretches along the south, eastern part of the state, all the way from Berks and Bucks County on the east, all the way out now to uh, the western end of uh, Pennsylvania. So like Jen said, it isn't if, but when, and up in the Finger Lakes now. So just keep an eye out. And if we don't get some reports this year, I wouldn't be doubt it if it would be by next year. So just keep your eyes open. And that's all I have. Yeah. I, did put the, I did put in the chat box some uh, Penn State website for spotted lanternfly. Thank but if you, you if you go spotted lanternfly, you Google it or whatever your search engine is, put spotted lanternfly. One of the first two that pops up is uh, uh, PA Gov, which is PDA stuff, and then um, Penn State's. Just to let you know, I'm going to end the polling in about 10 seconds. So if you're still sending stuff in, please hit submit now. <laughs> and ben, can I interrupt real quick? Absolutely. I also need the carrier with your phone number. I have to add some text into the, um, the email portion. So I need the, your carrier. So oh, Verizon. Uh, at and Cricket. Yes. So I apologize that I didn't get on that sooner, but thank you. We can also leave this going for just a couple minutes post if anybody does want to sign up or have a quick question for us after the fact. So we don't want to make you fumble to hurry up and get your everything in there. Does anybody have any extra questions for us? Well, we have been recording this. Thank you very much for attending. We appreciate your attentiveness and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. So I know some of you have had questions throughout. If you'd like to go back and reference it, that'll be there for you as well. I had a, just a few things to mention. Um, thank you, Brian. Before we oh, close. Before you say that, Brian, I would like to say thank you, Brian and Andy for and Kevin for all the work that you've put into this and for everyone else who has added in and been a part of the conversation. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any more questions? I, I did want to mention um, just a, a few materials that have been out. They're 
you know, we consider them pretty new, but they've been out for a year or two uh, or three in some cases. Uh, um, there's some new products called Aprovia, Aprovia Top, and Miravis Prime. Um, they're all succinate dehydrogenase inhibitors, uh, or at least one of the components in, in these materials. So they're all very, they're all excellent on powdery mildew. Um, Probably not something for a juice grape grower because I think they're a bit pricey. Um, although the Aprovia top might be, you know, a little bit more in line with with Revis top, but no reason really to use Aprovia top instead of Revis top because with Revis top you're going to get uh, uh, downy mildew control that you won't get with Aprovia top, um, and you can't use it. You know, because of the diphenaconazole in it, you're not going to be able to use it on concords anyway. Um, Aprovia alone by itself is just the succinate dehydrogenase inhibitor. Again, excellent on powdery mildew. The Miravis Prime is a combination material for uh, powdery mildew, black rot, and botrytis. So these are these are primarily wine grape materials. And like I said, they're a little pricier than what you know, might, you might be in the market for in, in the juice grape industry, but uh, any of you wine grape growers out there, I know there's a few of you in the audience uh, might want to at least look into these products. And if you have questions about them, let me know. Uh, but they're primarily powdery mildew materials and um, and background materials. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Brian. All right, well, that concludes our meeting. So thank you all for attending. If you are looking for New York State DEC applicate or credits, I will get them out in the mail to you after signing them and double checking all the things we have to do for the DEC. So it might be a while before you get them. But, um, and PDA, same thing. Andy, yeah, you and I have to go through the listing. Kate sent me all that information and um, I'll uh, send that out to PDA. Perfect. Thanks for attending everybody. If you have any questions, please remember that we are here for you. I can come out and do vineyard visits if, if need be. It's not that just because the office is closed, we are available and I know that that seems a bit disconnected. So give us a call, email us, we can come out and see you. Are we staying on the line after for anything? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, bye now. Thank you. Thanks everybody.